Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, my name is Anna McCloskey. I'm a postdoc in the Pelagic Ecosystems Lab here in the IOF. And um, it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Michelle Sang. Dr. Sang received her Master's of Science in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology from the University of Toronto and her PhD from Indiana University. She went on to complete her postdoctoral fellowship at UBC in 2008 and is now an assistant professor in the Department of Zoology and Botany and is affiliated with the Biodiversity Research Center. Dr. Singh's lab investigates how biotic and abiotic variables affect evolutionary and ecological processes in communities of insects and plankton. Species interactions are challenging to study and quantify. Doing so under changing environmental conditions introduces another order of complexity but these are the processes that will likely drive the largest ecosystem changes with the coming climate changes. Specifically, Dr. Tsang's Bugs and Plankton Lab studies evolutionary effects of climate change, the effect of global warming on aquatic food webs, and effects of global warming on body size. So in honor of Halloween, come along with us and hear about some cool creepy crawlies, maybe some swimmers too. I would also like to mention that in 2020, Dr. Sang led a commentary article about the low levels of racial diversity in the biological fields of evolution and ecology. She discussed her experiences being one of the few, if not the only person of color in academic and professional gatherings and addressed how people of color can approach the obstacles of entering these fields of study. After our speaker last week and the interest in the department on this subject, if you have questions with regards to this, please feel welcome to ask Dr. Sang at the end of the talk. And with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Sang. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Anna, um, for the really nice intro. And thank you um, to the IOF for the invitation to come speak. Yeah, I, I always feel a bit self-conscious when people say, actually say when you got your degrees, because I feel quite slow in my progression through academia. So I'll just add that I did actually leave academia for an extended period of time and I worked in academic publishing and then for um, you know, 10 or so years and then I have sort of <laughs> clawing my way back um, into academia and I'm, I'm super grateful and happy to be here and happy to be speaking with all of you today. Um, we have had one, um, oops. let's see if my slides want to advance. There we go. One land acknowledgement today. Oh, the red dot isn't coming up. Okay, there it is. Um, yeah, I, I've done a, I've been trying to do a lot of my homework and learning and reading about what it means to be an immigrant settler on, you know, unceded and ancestral lands of Musqueam. And also think more about um, this, re this red dot here is where I was born and raised on the farm in near Niagara Falls. Um, and sort of, and this map makes me think about all the people that were on these lands before me and my family and and all of the information actually, recently I've been thinking about all the information that's been lost um, over time as, as we spread our colonial ways all over, all over North America. Um, and just to sort of situate myself and um, my, I am second, gen, second generation um, from my family's from Taiwan and Taiwan is an interesting place because it's sort of, where the colonists become colonized themselves. It's an island that's been occupied by various different countries over time. And as ethnic Han Chinese, um, I'm guessing at some point, my ancestors also moved, were colonists to Taiwan and, and pushed out a lot of the uh, Aboriginal Taiwanese there. So a lot of thinking and learning and reflecting on how we can do better and how we can repair relationships with indigenous people, not only in Canada, but also in other parts of the world. So yeah, grateful for these opportunities. Okay, so my lab um, studies a bunch of different things. Um, 
And in general, we, we look at the effect of warming on simple communities. And we start with simple communities because honestly, if you can't predict what's gonna happen in a simple community, then what hope is there? <laughs> um, so we work on insects, um, museum collections, as well as live insects that we catch from outside. We have a lot of incubators in the lab where we do warming experiments and um, we also do a lot of work on aquatic uh, plankton. These are Daphnia. This is me up in Whistler um, collecting stuff. And we've just started working more, more and more on butterflies. And um, Natasha Clasios in the lab is also doing some work on microplastics. And a lot of we've had a lot of IOF help in getting our microplastics off the ground. So thank you very much for that. Um, we study temperature for a variety of reasons, and this is a really nice figure by Mary O'Connor and Joey Bernhardt, and it's nice, this figure sort of encapsulates, you know, how temperature can affect everything from metabolic, um, metabolic rates within cells to, you know, individual properties like respiration and photosynthesis to um, life history traits such as um, development time and all the way to um, population dynamics like, and consumer resource interactions and whole food web processes. And so we, we try to dabble in all of this with um, sort of jack of all trades and master of none, right? Um, and, and we, I mean, temperature work has been going on forever. And, and this, our, I mean, UBC in particular is really good at, at asking these questions and a lot of expertise here. And my, um, my particular interest is, so this is like a little tiny Petri, Petri glass Petri dish um, with, with, you know, 20 milliliters of liquid in it that I collected from campus. And you can see, depending how big your monitor is, you can, there's a dragonfly, there's mosquitoes, there's a um, glass worm, there's daphnia, various zooplankton, here's a water beetle. There's just, you know, organisms do not live in isolation. They live in these whole communities. And so even though we have a lot of good information on the effects of temperature on individuals and populations, we're, we're sort of lagging behind in how, how temperature affects um, communities. And that's sort of where my lab is situated. We take two approaches um, to looking at these effects of warming on, on communities. One is through this green box here is on resource and specifically on resource quality. So how does temperature affect the quality of the resource that something is eating? And then um, we try to follow that through to higher trophic level. So with primary consumers, um, how does the quality of the resource affect the quality of the primary consumer as well as productivity? And then further, how does it affect evolutionary adaptation of those primary consumers. And then um, also looking at secondary consumers, you know, how does what you eat affect how you do basically? And how is all of that affected by warming? So I'm gonna today I'm gonna share two, two experiments that we've done sort of along this approach, this approach of warming affecting food, food quality. Um, and the, the second approach we've been taking is sort of this approach to how does warming affect organism body size and through those body size changes, how do we, what are the you know, down, downstream effects of those changes in body size. Um, and an important piece, piece of background to note is that um, in nature, we often see this negative relationship between body size and temperature. So as temperature goes up, um, typically body size goes down and that's an intra, I'm talking about an intra specific pattern. Um, so for example, uh, mosquitoes that are, where the juveniles are raised at warmer temperatures, they tend to emerge at as smaller adults than mosquito juveniles that were grown at colder temperatures. Um, and that insect body size has a lot of, um, you can predict a lot from insect body size. You can predict sort of um, its ecological functions and, but we don't have a lot of good data on um, sort of in nature as well as um, in the lab on 
you know, translating those changes in insect body size to changes in ecological functions. So that's the experiment I'm gonna show you that we're just finishing up right now, actually. So that part's not published yet. Um, and one study that I won't share today is one I did with my Bio 411 insect ecology class a few years ago now. And that's, um, we looked at, in lab, in the lab setting, we know that insects decrease in size with warming. And in, here we use beetle, the beetle collections in the museum to show that beetles in British Columbia have been shrinking over time, most likely due to increasing uh, temperatures in the autumn. So um, that paper is out if you wanna read that on your own. Um, all right, did I miss anything? Okay, I mean, of course, other stressors in the world also matter. We're very temperature focused, um, but we all know that other things matter too. And I have two students, Natasha and Marcus. Um, Natasha is looking at the combined effects of microplastics and warming in aquatic ecosystems. And then Marcus is gonna be looking at more um, urbanization and how that affects um, mosquito adaptations and mosquito blood feeding and um, other good stuff. Okay, so then overall, this is sort of, this pretty picture encapsulates our work. We try to understand the fundamental role of temperature in shaping simple aquatic and insect communities. And um, hopefully, and you know, prediction is hard. Forecasting is really hard. Prediction is hard. But the goal is like, how, how are these simple communities going to change with ongoing warming? And um, I'm a bit preaching to the choir here, but we, we studied these organisms um, for a few different reasons. I mean, one, one is that they're just gorgeous and there's a huge diversity of them. And another reason is um, plankton and insects really are the sort of the foundation of, of the aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. And they also respond super quickly to warming and their, res uh, their responses have immediate effects on higher trophic levels. So that's why I sort of study the, the base and what's happening to the base. Okay, so I'm gonna start with um, an experiment that looks at this approach. So the effect of warming on um, primary consumers and secondary consumers. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of background for what we mean by resource quality and, and what are the predictions? What are we expecting to see? Um, so we're gonna start down here with this phytoplankton and I've totally stolen this image from um, Martin Brusen. And so when we, um, we're gonna warm up the phytoplankton and we're gonna see what's gonna to happen to the higher trophic levels. Um, and the backstory is that we, there's been a lot of literature out already, uh, published already on the effect of warming temperatures on um, healthy fats in phytoplankton and, and people in your group work on this too. Um, and typically we think that, um, and there's good evidence to show that warming reduces the amount of healthy fats in phytoplankton. Um, and so, and how do we quantify healthy fats? Typically we, um, we're primarily concerned with these long chain unsaturated fats um, called PUFAs, which are polyunsaturated fatty acids, and more specifically omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. And um, this ratio is gonna come up again later. So I'll just, note, I'll just draw your attention to it, the omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid. Um, so typically you want a lower ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. So you want more omega-3s than omega-6s. Well, that, that almost never happens. But anyway, the, the ratio is that the lower, the lower, the better, vaguely. <laughs> um, Okay, so that's sort of how we're quantifying quality is through these um, healthy fats. And so the question is, and this has been out in the literature for a while, is we know through lab studies that warming decreases these healthy fats in phytoplankton. And so what are, what is the consequences, what are the consequences of, for like, um, you know, what's gonna happen with ongoing warming? Um, will it affect the overall availability of, of these fats? In ecosystems and in aquatic ecosystems, and is that going to then sort of reduce the overall productivity of of, um, of these systems? Um, and the predict so the prediction is warming um, should 
result in decreased algal fats, which should re then result in fewer and smaller zooplankton and fewer and smaller invertebrate predators, and maybe also fewer and smaller fish. We're not going to test all of that. Um, that would be a really big experiment indeed. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to walk you through a study we did looking at warming in one species of phytoplankton, Sundedesmus obliquius, um, and its effects on one species of zooplankton, Daphne felix, and then, um, and then the higher level effects on the predator. This is uh, Chiaburus americanus, which is a predator of Daphne felix. So this is a very pared down um, community where we have the resource, the primary consumer, and the secondary consumer. And this work was um, done by um, a bunch of people in the lab. Um, and they were actually mostly undergrads at that time. So Yi Lin, who is just finishing up her undergrad at UBC. Carla finished her master's. Um, Ji Hun was an undergrad when she started this project and is now a master's student doing a different project that I'm gonna share later. Um, and, and then Madeline, um, and then also is a, the fatty acids were done with, in collaboration with uh, Duffy and Forster at Fisheries and Oceans Canada. The second, um, so I'll come back to this in one second. I just wanted to give you a quick preview of the second experiment that we I wanted to share with you. And this is, um, you know, warming is happening for a long time. Warming doesn't just happen for short periods of time. And so we are very interested in with prolonged warming and prolonged changes in maybe these, these healthy fats. You know, what are the more long-term evolutionary consequences of warming? So here we just looked at um, algae and daphnia, but we, we ran it for a really long time and we looked at how does you know, rapid evolution in phytoplankton affect um, um, sort of ability of, of daphnia to evolve also to warming. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Okay, so back to that short-term experiment. This is what we did. We had, um, we grew algae at um, three different temperatures. And um, we also grew the Daphnia at three different temperatures. And then the Chiaburus um, were just grown at two temperatures, I believe. And we measured a bunch of things, cell size, fatty acids. We also measured something called neutral lipids, which I haven't introduced yet, but in, algae, in this particular species of algae, neutral lipids are sort of these general um, fat bodies that occur throughout the cell. Um, in Daphnia pulex, the goal was to also measure fatty acids and Daphnia, um, also to measure population size over time as a measure of productivity. And then with Chiaburus, Chiaburus have a one-year um, generation time, so here we just measured individual growth rates. Um, unfortunately, our Daphnia populations crashed right at the end, so we did not, we were not able to measure the fatty acids in Daphnia, but we still have good uh, biomass estimates and productivity estimates. Okay, so what are the predictions here? As I mentioned earlier, we, um, we have some idea of how phytoplankton should respond to warming, so we expected decreased cell size, um, decreased PUFAs and the higher, um, with warming, we expected more, um, a higher ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids and decreased lipids. And all of that together is sort of our way of saying, this is a poor quality resource. So with warming, you get all these changes in the algae and they're actually, they're kind of a junky food item at that point. Um, so I'll show you what we found. Um, so here are all the, on the left here are all the um, algae results. And so the top panel is total PUFA. And we actually didn't see an effect of temperature on total polyunsaturated fatty acids. It was a bit of a surprise. Um, we did see a decrease in, so tags are these neutral lipids, um, we did see um, the amount of total number of neutral lipids went down um, with warming. And then the omega-3, omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids, the prediction is that um, 
so the lower is better. So you, we, we expected to see lower in colder, lower ratio in colder temperatures. And we did see that with this relation, there's, a, there's tons and tons of variation. And so this relationship, although it was in the right, this, this result, although it was in the right, the predicted uh, direction, it wasn't statistically significant. So, you know, warming does decrease some algal fats. It wasn't totally in the way that we predicted. But what, um, what we did notice is that temperature, like algae, we think are re re restructuring their fat component and their fat profiles in response to warming. And so, you know, does this matter? Does this, how does, does this restructuring matter? Does it turn algae into a poor quality resource like we thought it would? So we then we fed all these different types of algae to the Daphnia that were each being grown at these three different temperatures. And I'll show you the results for that. Um, so here are the algae being at three different temperatures, and then we fed um, each of those to um, Daphnia, which we have a lot of jars in our lab. Actually, I should like show you my office because my, my office is now a storage room for glass jars. Um, okay, so I'll show you first the, the data for um, Daphnia that were grown at 12 degrees. So Daphnia, we have, there's three different temperatures here. We grew Daphnia at three different temperatures, 12, 20, and 28. They don't actually do that well at the higher temperatures, and you'll see sort of what happens to them. Um, so first of all, the 12C. Um, so yeah, I'll walk you through this. This is the purple is um, 12C Daphnia fed 12C algae. The blue is 12C Daphnia fed 20C algae, and then the red is 12C algae fed 28C algae. And you can see, sort of as predicted, the, the cold um, algae sustained higher Daphnia population sizes. So which suggests to us that that restructuring of the fats in response to warming does turn it into, um, does turn the algae into potentially a lower quality resource. So that was kind of nice to see. Um, what about the Daphnia that were grown at 20 degrees? We still see that response. So um, Daphnia that were fed the colder reared algae still maintaining slightly higher population sizes over time. And then what's interesting is when we when you look at the highest temperature um, that we grew Daphnia at, we don't see an effect of algal type food type anymore. So now these um, Daphnia were just sort of uh, growing at very low levels the whole time and the food that you gave them didn't matter. So what do we take away from all of this? Um, Algae are slightly fattier when grown at colder temperatures and they've restructured their fats. Um, and, and it seems to be that the benefits of cold reared algae diminish as the, daf as the Daphnia growing temperature increases. Um, and I'll come back to this in a second. And, and we actually, I'm not gonna show you the results, but we, we didn't actually see an effect of food type um, on k growth rate. Uh, but chaobras are really hard to grow in the lab well, uh, so I'll, I'll take that with a grain of salt. Um, we would like to repeat this part of the experiment at some point. Okay, so back to this slide. Remember, our, we, I was saying, well, you know, we're worried about decrease in, in food quality with warming and that this will translate into lower productivity um, in higher trophic levels. Did we actually see that? Um, yes and no, I'd say. We, we did see that colder reared algae were a higher quality food resource and that they sustained higher Daphnia population sizes. But also I think importantly is that um, it also depended, the result also depended on the temperature that the Daphnia were being grown at. And so this makes me think maybe that, you know, maybe we don't need as many, we as in pretending I'm a Daphnia, if I'm a Daphnia, maybe I don't need as many of those healthy fats when I'm growing at um, a warmer temperature. And, and if that's the case, then that sort of maybe should trigger a discussion on, you know, when we're thinking about the quality of nutrients changing with warming, let's also be thinking about, you know, maybe our, our nutritional needs are also changing with warming. And so how do those two things um, interact? 
Okay, um, that what I think that's all I was going to say about that project. Um, Jihan is now um, a master student in the lab, and she's just finished a really nice experiment where um, where she warmed up in tight. Not you sort of um, graduated from single species, and we're going full on to whole communities, and um, she's 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 warmed up whole communities of phytoplankton um, in the lab and is and fed them to whole communities of zooplankton and so now we're looking at okay how does warming affect um, species richness and community composition and community level resources um, like the, so fatty acids nitrogen phosphorus in the whole community and then how does that affect um, diversity and community composition and um, and also um, uh, nutrients in uh, in fatty acids in the zooplankton community. So that work is ongoing, and um, I'll let in a, in a few months. Hopefully, Jihan will have be presenting her work, and we should uh, get you all to tune in for that. Okay, um, the second. Um, study here. I'm actually I'm only just going to give you a preview because the study is long and complicated and a bit difficult to explain. But the general gist is that we were really interested in long term responses to warming. And does it have the potential, this warming and change in resource quality have the potential to, to actually alter how the consumer evolves to some other um, stressor. And in this case, the stressor is temperature. So we grew um, Sunidesmus for 75 generations at two temperatures, 12 and 18, and we grew Daphnia pulex for 15 generations um, at two temperatures, 12 and 18. And 15 generations in Daphnia is about six months. Um, and the expectation is that, so we're growing Daphnia at 12 degrees and at 18 degrees. And we're expecting them over time, we're expecting those populations to diverge evolutionarily. Um, and so that's what I mean by evolution, that we see phenotypic differences. At the end of the day, we see phenotypic differences between those two populations. So, um, and for those of you interested, um, actually, I think I have, I have mechanism and predictions coming up. So I'll just talk about that. Okay, so how, how does this actually work? Um, we expect algae to evolve rapidly to warming. Um, and I'm not, we did see that, and I'm not gonna talk about that today, but if you're interested, we saw um, signatures of adaptation of evolution in photosynthetic rates and, and respiration. Um, and we, but over a while, similar to the other study, we expected um, the warmer reared algae to be a lower quality food resource. And if this is true, Daphnia that are fed the lower quality resource should have a lower population size and lower genetic variation overall. And that is because we are starting with, we set the genetic variation going into this experiment. We go outside, we collect thousands and thousands of Daphnia, and that's our standing genetic variation that we're working with. We're not expecting evolution to happen through um, de novo mutations, just through sort of lineage sorting of who does well at 12 degrees and who does well at 18 degrees. And if you have a lower population size, we expect some of those alleles to just flip out um, due to drift. And so if you're um, lower population size and you have lower genetic variation, we expect then that Daphnia that we're eating the poorer quality food should actually, um, if you're growing Daphnia at two temperatures, 12 and 18, and they're, um, they all have low population sizes, we actually expect um, a reduced evolutionary response to temperature. So in other words, we expect no change in, no evolutionary divergence in those 12 and 18 degree Daphnia um, when they're fed a crappy food. Um, I'm, not, I'm actually gonna skip over the, all the gory details of the results um, and I'm just gonna jump right to the summary. Um, and so that's the next slide. And that's, so what did we find? We found, um, just as the, in the other experiment, cold evolved um, or cold reared algae sustained 
higher Daphnia population sizes. Um, and then interestingly, we did see that cold evolved algae facilitated thermal evolution in Daphnia body size. So some of the traits we did see this predicted effect of greater evolutionary divergence in those two selection lines, but only when they were fed cold reared algae. Um, but that we didn't see that for all of the traits, only for some of the traits. Um, and this paper is published out in evolutionary applications if you did want to read all the gory details um, of, of it. But just sort of in the interest of time, um, I didn't wanna, I just wanted to share that resource quality matters for consumer evolution. And this is the study that we did to show that. Um, and so we do think that the mechanism, although we did not test for genetic variation per se, we do think that um, the mechanism is related to resource quality affecting demography, which then mediated the evolutionary response of Daphne to warming. Um, so here, um, this first approach of changing resources and because of temperature and how does it affect primary consumer productivity, evolutionary responses of the primary consumer. Um, and we haven't done a good job yet on the secondary consumers, but we're getting there. So these are simple communities and I hope I've convinced you that, you know, warming does change resource quality, especially in these aquatic systems. And those changes have immediate consequences for both uh, primary consumer productivity and primary consumer evolutionary rates. Um, so that sort of wraps up that approach to our lab. Um, I'm just gonna check on the time. The, the second approach that I wanted to share is this, um, this fixation that I have with insect body size. Um, and so as I mentioned earlier, insects tend to um, decrease in size with, uh, with warming. And we had one paper showing that beetles have shrunk in BC over time. Um, because of climate change. And so when, when we published that bio paper, the number one question that we got from everybody, from media, from other scientists was, why does this matter? Who cares if insects are shrinking with climate change? Um, and that actually was a bit hard to answer. We didn't, we didn't have good data for that. We certainly didn't have the beetle data to go with the beetle. Um, study. We know from other people's mosquito work, for example, that, you know, bigger mosquitoes take bigger blood meals, and so they have a higher chance of spreading disease. Um, but what about for other organisms? And so we tackled this question of like the who cares about shrinking insects with butterflies. And this, this stuff um, that I'm going to present is, is not published yet. So um, as I mature in my old age, I do think that peer review does help my work. So take this with a grain of salt. I'm sure it'll get better after peer review. Um, so here in a nutshell is, is what we did. This actually started off as a COVID project in 2020. Um, we couldn't go anywhere. So this is actually my front yard right here with kale plants. Um, so we, we tested the effect of temperature on body size and flight um, in the cabbage white. If you, if you are around Vancouver in, uh, from May to September, cabbage whites are everywhere. <laughs> so this is the cabbage white right here, Pyrrhus rape. And um, we asked the, <laughs> we didn't ask them, we just said, please, can you lay some eggs? So we, I put out some kale and they came and they laid eggs, which is very convenient. And then we, we this is my kitchen table because this was COVID. <laughs> um, they laid their eggs um, and we, we stuck the eggs in the incubators in the lab and we grew them at three different, three different temperatures. We measured body size and flight. This is, um, these are, hopefully this works. You see those guys flying around. These are cabbage whites in my basement. <laughs> Um, I still have, actually, I can't, um, kind of one of these can't stop, won't stop. I still have cabbage whites in the house, much to my husband's dismay. He's like, why do you always, he's a botanist, why do you always have to be growing herbivores in the house? <laughs> um, so these are, these are some of the things we deal with at our house. Um, 
So we measured body size and we measured flight. So this is our flight mill. Now, hopefully you see a butterfly tethered um, to a rod and the rod is spinning around and the, it's attached to a photo gate and the photo gate is attached to a computer and it's, it's recording um, um, it's recording the, the, the time between revolutions. And, and, and so from that data, we can get speed, average speed and maximum speed and all that stuff. Um, I don't, you probably can't see that in the middle, but that we had a really hard time with getting the, a ball bearing that was frictionless enough that a butterfly as small as a cabbage white could actually pull the entire flight mill. And it turned out that the ball bearing that worked the absolute best was the one that's found in this children's toy called a fidget spinner. So we actually have a fidget spinner attached to our flight mill so that our, um, the cabbage weights could fly properly. Um, so what did we find? Um, again, this is not unpublished work, so take it all with a grain of salt. Um, we found that higher temperatures resulted in smaller wings. So here's rearing temperature on the x-axis and then total wing area on the y and it, um, wing area goes down with temperature. And interestingly, um, when you, at warmer temperatures, you get smaller wings, but you don't get a huge change in, in mass. And so what you get is you get cut, um, wing this ratio of wing loading which is mass divided by um, wing size goes up which means that you're you're heavier and you're, you have smaller wings and that means that you actually shouldn't be able to fly as well because your your small wings are trying to move around this this relatively big mass we found these two things um, two traits related to wing size and then um, we also found that the data are pretty um, messy but significant-ish. <laughs> um, so total, this is total wing area on the x-axis and average velocity on the, on the y. And we did see a positive relationship. So the, the bigger you are, the faster you fly. And conversely, the smaller you are, the slower you fly. And then these red dots are the mean of the, the hot temperature. The, the, so the 30 degree mean, the 18 degree mean, and then the, the, the sorry, 30. Uh, 24 and 18 degree means. So that was nice. We weren't sure if we would see that with our flight mill, but we do see some signature of relationship between wing size and flight speed. With respect to distance flown, we actually um, saw this nonlinear relationship where, um, you know, smaller, if you have smaller wings, you did fly for a shorter distance. Um, and, but the biggest ones actually don't fly for the largest distance. There's this like, tailing off um, sort of diminishing returns-ish curve of, of the relationship between total wing area and, and distance flown. And this wasn't quite, there's a lot of variation and a lot of scatter in this plot and it's not quite statistically significant. Okay, so we found, uh, what did I just say? So warming results in smaller wings and you don't fly as fast and potentially also don't fly as far. And so here comes the so what question again. Um, what does this have to do with anything in nature? Um, with cabbage weights, we, we were saying, you know, if you don't fly as far, maybe you don't, maybe you won't spread your eggs out in a, in a, in a large area. And maybe that way you won't be as big a pest to, um, you know, Vancouver kale plants as you could be. But we are also interested in pollination. Um, Cabbage whites, like other butterflies, um, are pollinators. And so these two, um, they take nectar from various plants and they get pollen sort of all over their face. Um, and so the last summer, um, my student went out and collected a whole bunch of cabbage whites and then a quantified um, amount of pollen. So these are wild caught um, cabbage whites. And here are the data for the pollen. So this is, again, just to reiter reiterate, these are, these are wild caught now. These are not lab generated. Um, so here's total wing area and pollen count. And again, we see this sort of 
uh, nonlinear relationship. And these diamonds, I've just superimposed the lab results onto this wild caught, um, the wild caught data, because I was curious to see like, how do our lab results compare with wild caught butterflies? And they're actually remarkably consistent, which was a nice finding. Um, so the smaller ones, um, this is a log scale. So it's actually a little bit, um, the difference is a little bit bigger than it's shown here, but the, the smaller, smaller, smaller butterflies in nature, they collect, they have, they collect less pollen. And when you look at pollen diversity, we also see this relationship between the fewer pollen grains you have, the less diverse, um, the less diverse they are as well. So you, you visit fewer flowers. So I'm gonna um, try to wrap up so there's time for questions. So in the lab, we found smaller butterflies fly more slowly, they cover less distance. And then in the wild, smaller butterflies carry less pollen and visit fewer flowers. And those body sizes that were, we generated in the lab were almost identical to the size variation that we saw in nature, which was really nice. And this, all of this butterfly work was the total heroic efforts of um, Erez Buyukimaz, who was um, who worked in my lab for two years, first as a honors student, and then as a, um, he won a couple of the Work Learn Undergraduate Research Awards, and he did an amazing job. I'm trying to grow butterflies without him right now, and it's going miserably, so I, 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 I'm hoping that he um, gets back from Turkey so he can help us out again. Okay, um, I want to last few slides to wrap up. Um, I've shown you three simple studies on, um, on simple systems that looking at using two different approaches to study the effect of warming on, on these simple plankton and insect communities. Um, I've shown you that warming res reduces resource quality, which then decreases consumer productivity and evolution. And then on, on the other hand, I've shown you that warming reduces body size um, and which has uh, consequences for um, butterfly behavior as well as plants insect interactions. So, you know, what, where are we going from here and what are the sort of larger implications of this work? In aquatic systems, um, you know, absolutely, we believe that nutrient availability is changing with warming. Um, and we're, we're actively working on, you know, what are the consequences of, of new, this change in nutrient availability. Of course, we mainly work on these small scale um, freshwater communities, um, but hopefully, as I said earlier, that makes things a little bit more tractable than trying to work in, in oceans like many, many of you do quite well there. Um, and then with insects, we, um, our work and other people's work, um, are, we're showing that warming is definitely changing body size technology, voltanism, and and now the next step I think is is to look at you know what's happening now with plant insect interactions. I mean, insects and plants have a long coevolutionary history, and so. Um, to me, it's quite interesting to think about what, what are some of the consequences for these plant-insect interactions. And then with that, I'd like to thank, um, I mean, so grateful for all these wonderful people who I get to work with day in and day out. Um, yeah, so I didn't, I talked only a little bit about the evolution study, but that was co-authored by um, Joey Bernhardt and Xander Chila, and then the, um, the resource quality study, and then Karen Needham in the museum helped a lot with the beetle study, and then and Erez um, with the butterfly study. And thank you all for listening, and thank you to my funding sources. And um, yeah, if you, all the papers except for the butterfly one are linked on my website. So if you want to find out more, I'm, I'm you're, you're welcome to come find me. I am like literally across, I'm looking at your building right now from my office. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to, always happy to chat with all of you about any of this stuff. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much, so much Michelle, for, uh, for a great talk. And uh, I love the fact that you drew us from the ocean to the land or from the water to the land. Um, Amanda, I'm going to um, use my um, facilitator hand to just ask a quick question, if that's OK, ahead of yours. But you're definitely next. Um, so I um, basically on the heels of the butterfly study that you did, the, the first thing that came to my mind is the impact on migrations. Um, and so particularly thinking about, you know, how monarch butterflies are in dire straits, whether you think that that could potentially have applications to, to them as well. Um, so maybe if you could touch briefly on that. Thank yeah, you. yeah, thanks, Colette. That was a great question. Well, that, originally we wanted to do this project on monarchs. Um, monarchs are endangered in Canada. You are not allowed to fly. You're not allowed to send monarchs through federal airspace. Um, so we would have had to collect them, driven to probably Washington or Idaho and collected them there. Um, but then because of COVID, everything was shut down. So. Hence the cabbage weight. <laughs> the cabbage weight came in as our hero. Um, but yeah, we um, I've talked a lot with some actual monarch biologists about shrinking wings. Uh, and there is some concern with monarchs, it's, qu it's quite difficult to tie monarch body size to climate because of all the different generations are being generated at different latitudes. And so you have to think about how there's the whole latitudinal factor that applies in as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Go ahead, Amanda. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. I absolutely love the talk. It set me thinking in all sorts of new directions and I'm just really excited by some of the ideas it's prompted. So thank you so very much for that. And one of the ones, I just have a comment before I ask my question. I started browsing while I was listening attentively. I started browsing about fin size in fishes and how that responds to temperature, which intrigued me a lot. And I found that at least one study, I didn't browse too much because I was listening, but at least one study shows that um, the pectoral fins actually did get smaller with temperature, but the dorsal fin did not. And the body shape changed too. So now they're trying to figure out how this affects swimming ability with the temperature maybe disproportionately affecting different fins. Anyhow, that's something I'd love to chat with you about. But the thing that I wanted to ask was my, my logical or illogical conclusion was that if you're dealing with species at higher trophic levels where you've had I'm trying to understand whether higher trophic levels might be expected to show more effects of this um, changing um, lipid profile with phytoplankton or fewer effects. And so I'd love you just to muse on how different trophic levels might be affected by this initial starting state of poorer quality lipids in, um, in phytoplankton at, at higher temperatures. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Um, We've gone back and forth on this question a lot. Um, and, and and Brian, I think, also probably had some good answers to this question. The um, it I think it really depends on how much of those lipids you can you can produce yourself based on like from those from building blocks. So Maybe, maybe you don't need like the um, EPA and DHA because you can actually make EPA and DHA. Um, so, so for Daphnia, we know that Daphnia um, fatty acid profiles are highly tied into the algal um, fatty acid profiles, but I don't know, I've not read an experiment that went from zooplankton fish, for example, or zooplankton. We did go from zooplankton to, to Chaobarus, but we didn't have the sample size that we needed to get those data. So but could you do it even indirectly where you didn't necessarily follow all the trophic levels in between? But I mean, I understand it would, I think sometimes can we just do things by empirical work and find patterns and then generate the hypotheses out of those patterns? Anyhow, I want to have lunch with you sometime and play with you. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, oh, thank Anna. you, Amanda. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Michelle. No, nope, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think that Gabriel had a question as well, so I'll pass it over to him. Hello, Michelle. Thank you for your great presentation. Um, in, with climate change, uh, climate, in climate change science, especially when we work on biodiversity, we always assume that with 
increasing temperature, we're going to have a forward shift in the distribution of species. And with your result on insect, you're showing that the mobility of the species is decreasing because of the body size shrinking and the size of the wing shrinking. Do you think we, based on your result, do you think that we overestimate the, this, this potential poleward shifting of species, especially when for insects or zooplankton, um, based on your result? No, I don't think you're overestimating. And mainly because I, my, I teach the fourth year insect ecology class here and we talk a lot about insect movement with warming. And it, it does seem like there's really good data to support that, what you just said, that insects are moving uh, with warming. And it, one big thing that we don't know is is how voltanism will change. So you might be, when, when you're warmer, you, yes, you're probably smaller, but maybe you also can add in a whole other generation in the summer. And so does that mean then that there's actually more of you out there, but that you're just smaller? And so if there are more of you out there, where are you going? So sort of, that's, that's how I think about it right now. Um, and, and maybe to, I mean, we tested flight on a, in a very artificial way, like everybody, lots and lots of people test flight on a flight mill and it, you have to wonder, you know, somebody needs to do the study where they do the flight mill study, take the butterfly off the flight mill and chuck it outside and then map, see how far they go outside and see how tightly correlated those are. But I no, I don't think you're, you're overestimating. Thank you. Nicola, go ahead, please. Hi, so great talk, Michelle. I was wondering, um, so how would this play out if you have invasive zooplankton that is say more warm adapted um, so that they're not as sensitive to say these changes in um, food quality from the phytoplankton? Do you think that that would lead to kind of, and then also if you talk about the fact that as things get warmer, the potential for uh, evolution, at least divergence between groups decreases. Do you think over time that this could lead to homogenization of, of uh, freshwater systems uh, with invaders that are warm adapted? Yeah, there's a lot in that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, I don't know if you can visualize that Daphne result in your head, but one thing that struck me a lot was Daphnia population size was much more strongly affected by Daphnia growing temperature than it was by the food it was eating. Like the, the pattern was like, there's like a high bar and then the lower bar, lowest set of bars and then the lowest set of bars. Mm -hmm. And and I didn't, I, so I didn't talk about that much. I just said, oh, they don't do well at 30 degrees. Um, and but I think the importance of that result is that um, food quality does matter, but there are other things in their communities that probably matter more. And so being overrun by a warm adaptive invasive is, is probably a much stronger selective force than eating junk food. Um, does that make sense? Like, I think, I think when we go out into these natural systems, we need to think about what's having the strongest role right now. And, um, and invasive species, for example, is one of them and warming is one of them. And I think the direct effect of warming on the organism itself is a much stronger force than the effect of warming on the foods that they're eating. And so mm -hmm. I think these all come together to sort of shape the system. But if you had to prioritize, for example, I think um, invasive the interactions, those direct biotic interactions with invasive species or that direct interaction you're having with the temperature is probably a much stronger force. Is that, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> I hope it was close. Yeah, it was. But what about the part about the potential for evolution? Um, um... Yeah. I'm not sure. I think so. 
the smaller your population sizes, the less the less adapt evolutionary potential you have. And so, in, to me, when I think about it, I'm thinking, okay, what is governing? What are the key factors that are driving population size um, in this system? And so, for example, if in, if you're getting outcompeted by an invasive species, then I think that's the selective force that's gonna that you're responding to, and maybe you're. Um, whatever else you're evolving to might not matter. It might be that the strongest, like whatever, you sort of look at the system and see what is the strongest source pressure. of selection. Yeah, yeah selection mm -hmm. pressure. Yeah, that's sort of how I think about it. Thank you for your Thank question. You. Okay. Thank you again, Michelle, for a great talk um, on behalf of the Iowa.